This is Leonard Nimoy, Mr. Spock, the co-star of Star Trek. I'd like to know what this role is that you play. Just, just what is the role that you're well, starting Well, basically, Mr. Spock is, uh, is a, uh, a product of a marriage between an Earth woman and a Vulcan male. Vulcan is a planet outside of our solar system. And uh, he's uh, physically very similar to the human in anatomy, but his uh, psychological and emotional orientation are quite different. He has complete emotional control. He is very scientifically oriented and is a very logical creature, you say. Uh, the point is that Vulcan was a planet that was very warlike and a very fierce race of people who almost did themselves in because they were always in conflict with each other and their emotions were so strong that they finally decided that emotion had to be done away with. And it became uh, uh, a wise choice to uh, control emotions and gradually breed them out of the race so that they could function more logically and survive. Well, you very seldom show emotion then. Is this very difficult? Seldom. Well, you mean from an acting point of view? Yes, from an acting point of view. Excuse me. Uh, it's a challenge. It's a challenge. But, of course, that's my job. Uh, showing emotion or not showing emotion, whichever the case yes. may be, is the actor's craft. You know, I'm often surprised when a, when a man comes in uh, to my house and can fix a leaky faucet, you know, uh, that I've been working on perhaps for a couple of hours and only managed to make it worse, you see. That's his craft. He comes in and does it. My craft is to play interesting and unusual characters. Why is your part so successful, do you suppose? Well, I think there are a lot and of it reasons. Is. Well, evidently, yeah. Uh, the male would, would seem to indicate that. There are a lot of reasons. I think uh, it starts with the physical appearance. I think the fact that he is uh, such a, uh, uh, a wise individual. I think people are, are fascinated with the idea that, that a man in the future may know something that we don't know today. I think they look to him for answers. He's a very dignified man and commands respect. Uh, he's... Uh, obviously very intelligent. The control of the emotions, I think, is a very important thing. The fact that he's cool, the fact that he's sophisticated, he doesn't get riled in a situation. He has control of himself. All of these things are working, I think. Your makeup is most unusual. Does that take a long time? Well, it takes an hour and a half, which, after you've done it for the 150th, 175th time, seems like a very long time. Yes. <laughs> And whose idea was it to have pointed ears? Well, that started with Gene Roddenberry, who's the creator of the series, the executive producer. He, uh, he saw the character with pointed ears and various other physical things which we experimented with. And, and I should say that just before we started shooting the show, we had experimented with four or five different types of ears. And we were not happy with any of them. And I got a little nervous about it. I thought this is going to be awful funny if these ears don't look right. And I went to Gene and I asked him to give up the idea of the pointed ears. And he said, no, he wouldn't. We're going to keep working on this, and we'll get it right eventually. And he said, I promise you that if you do the show with the ears, at the end of 13 episodes, if you're not happy, I'll write you a script where you get an ear job. What and, are uh, they made of? They're made of foam rubber. And it's a, it's a tip, a foam rubber tip that's cast in a mold that's made specifically for my ear, and it fits up on top of my ear. And it takes about an hour and a half. Not just for the ears, the just eyebrows the entire, and the entire and, makeup. Uh -huh. yeah. Is it, are they uncomfortable to wear at all? Oh, sometimes, but uh, not terribly. I've more or less gotten used to them. My ears have become accustomed to the point. To being pointed. <laughs> People recognize you, don't they? Yeah, I guess the hair makes it pretty easy to spot. Of course, I have had young children in stores and places when I've been shopping say, that man has a haircut just like Spock. <laughs> really? Yeah. And they didn't realize what they were saying. Well, and then on a second look, they say, could it be? You know, that kind of thing. Well, it is your own hair. <laughs> yes, it is. Yes, it's a bit it of it. It's yeah. beautiful. It's nice and Thank thick. You. You're definitely tight now. Can you think of other parts? Uh, do you think it'll be difficult to take other parts? I really don't worry about that for this reason. If, if I were to concern myself with that while I was playing Spock, I think that playing Spock would cease to be the pleasure that it is. I'm having as much fun playing him as I possibly can. When the time comes to think about other characters, I'll start thinking about that then. Well, it is so successful. It could go on for years anyway, couldn't it? Well, I would hope so. I'd, I'd like to have a steady job for a while. <laughs> yeah. Heat of your ship, how fast does it go? Well, we, uh, we get into trouble if we try to move any faster than warp 8, which what's, what's is warp eight, 8 times the speed of light. It's awful fast. We have gone faster than that in rare emergencies, but we try to avoid that because it's awful rough on the ship and it's rough on the system. I would think so. Well, beaming down, is that painful? 
They mean down. You mean that process when we leave the ship leave, and uh, come yes. down onto a planet? No, it's not as a rule. Uh, what it what it amounts to is uh, very briefly we take uh, matter, which is the human body, and we convert that to energy, and we move it from one place to another, just the way you move a television picture from the studio into people's homes. And when we get it to the place we want it to be, we reconvert it to matter. Now, uh, under how ordinary circumstances. How long does that take? How much oh, time? just a few just, just seconds. Like a few seconds, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, just, it doesn't take very long for the picture to get from the studio to somebody's home, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, that's under normal circumstances. We don't have any difficulties. Sometimes we run into barriers, just the way a person runs into trouble if they have a mountain between the studio and their home. Their reception is a little difficult, and getting through those mountains is kind of rough. Well, yeah. What do you do in a case like that? Oh, suffer a lot, yeah. It's painful, then. Is yeah. a lot of suffering going on? <laughs> no, we make it all right. <laughs> well, are there any of these things that you do, could they actually take place scientifically? The scientists tell me that they could. The people uh, in the various NASA installations that I've visited, and, and they're certainly the people whose opinions I respect, tell me that we work constantly with a thread of scientific possibility in our shows, that we're not doing fantasy, that we're doing potential science fiction. We're doing science fiction, which means potential science possibility. You know. Children think of this part that you take. My children? Yes. They're very excited about it and, and very proud of it, I think, particularly because Spock is a character that you can take pride in. You know, it's nice for a change for me to be playing a character that my children can be can be pleased to identify with. For a long time, I played some pretty nasty characters, and I don't think they were too excited about that. Do they always watch your show? <laughs> always, yeah. Well, you've been a delightful guest. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. It's been a pleasure us. to be here. Thank you very much.